from New York City. Yeah, all right. Good. I happen to be the New York City co-leader of the Go Meetup, so I just have to shout out. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Kelsey. I'm the CEO and founder of PopTip. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience with Go and Node and the learnings along the way. So it's from one shiny object to the other. Um, before I start, <laughs> let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Obviously, I told you to go meet up in New York City, have an incredible team, but um, PopTip is a product that helps provide companies with a statistical breakdown of what the crowd's public opinion is. Um, we help our customers understand public consensus, and we do that by analyzing conversation from online. Our problems range from hand handling streaming data, NLP, machine learning, topic modeling, basically everything sexy that you hear, that's what we do. Um, and basically, our customers range from CNN to ESPN to Spotify to L'Oreal. So these guys are folks that really demand um, you know, the highest level of performance. And I think that to kind of frame the discussion, I used to write a little bit more code than I do today. But um, now I let the, let the other group members on our team do the heavy lifting, so I have to give them credit. Um, why Node.js? So when we first started, a little, a little under two years ago, we chose Node as our primary language, not because it was the top post on Hacker News, but because of a few different things. So, um, you know, I, I wrote JavaScript and I felt like I could take that transition into Node. But a little bit more background, from a speed of development standpoint, you know, we gave it an A for our specific situation. It was A for a small code base, C minus for a big code base. We're talking callback soup, it is a thing, we have seen it. Um, modern features, we were all real time, and so having the ability to use WebSockets super easily was incredible. Um, Runtime speed, all right, cost of purchase was free, so that was great. Um, and the cost to administer, you know, it was also pretty cheap, comparatively speaking, to .NET. Um, Momentum, A. So if you know JavaScript, we had guys who could just quickly get up and running right away. Um, the talent pool, you know, we did have a few kids who were self-taught, no JSers. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't the Ruby community, it wasn't the Python community, but um, we did get a lot of folks in there that were good people, and we actually had someone on our team who has contributed to Node.js before, so that was helpful. Um, active community, I give it a B at the time, honestly, because it's super, it was super active a little, um, a little under two years ago, but not mature in any way, shape, or form. Um, the framework wars were just, I mean, I'm not even gonna get into it, but it's like we already have a framework, there's no need, but you know, uh, you neither here nor there. So um, language homogeneity, you know, JS all over, it was kind of cool looking at GitHub and just seeing like what percentage of your code base was JavaScript. Um, large code base support, not a lot of it, you know, there is, I think that almost every single talk that was out at the time was about how to get up and running with Node, and Hello World was about the only thing that was out in terms of what you could do. And yeah, it's great if you can get a web server up and running, but it wasn't super helpful from a large code base standpoint, but it was important for us from a you know, MVP, let's just get some prototype out there into the world. From a coolness factor, yes, there's A plus at the time, Evil Empire, JS fanboys blocked, and so I think from a recruiting standpoint as well, as a single founder, you know, people were interested in joining, and they were interested in joining at all levels of the spectrum. So um, that was why we chose Node. But um, once we got going a little bit, after about a month or two out in the wild, SportsCenter decided to use PopTip, and they decided to use it in a very, very big way to kick off the NFL season. So, you know, we are a team of about two or three engineers, and there really isn't a lot of infrastructure built in. Um, and in fact, a few months after launch, we started getting this popular, this popular momentum, and it was really difficult for us to sustain, to, to stay up. I mean, literally, we were toppling over, um, and that technical debt that we accrued just from having to go about building a product from an MVP perspective was definitely making, you know, making some major waves. Um, we had this uh-oh moment, and we were like, all right, it's time for us to move beyond building from an MVP perspective and confront the technical debt head on. There was multiple things that were happening 
that we were just kind of like, okay, how are we going to deal with this? Multiple application layer instances could not be brought up in tandem. If we, um, you know, we had major issues with the single point of failure, and if the machine that was hosting um, hosting the instance were to go down, or the application were to crash, we would be in major trouble. And this this happened, so um, we were confronted with it. All functions of our service were literally handled with a single process. Okay, so we had exceptionally high CPU and network load. Um, and on top of that, we had increased latency as a result. So we started to see this, this sort of um, slowness start to take shape, especially when we had really high levels of, of analysis. So what, I, what would happen is ESPN would say, hey, who do you think the best player is of the game? And we would get thousands and thousands of tweets coming back at us. And we would be parsing those tweets, processing those tweets, and finding consensus. And the problem was, was that there was inability to scale horizontally. Nothing was separated out. Um, serving HTML, processing Twitter data, maintaining our socket connection states were not separated into their own processes, and we had no clean abstraction layer. So we were basically faced with this moment of, all right, like it's time to confront the boss and be like, this is not going to work. Um, you know, between fundraising on my end and then also dealing with product development and product design and product roadmap, it was a really, I think, difficult time from a startup perspective. Um, we could not afford to just stop feature development and say, oh, let's just switch out the architecture, let's just go switch languages, no big deal. We can just, you know, pull ourselves up for a little while. We were growing rapidly. People were starting to use the product all the time. We hired a salesperson, so we were actively soliciting customers. Um, and timing and prioritization was everything. So we really had to take a step back and think about, okay, you know, how do we approach this issue? We do have something that's taken off, and it's great that it's taken off. But now that we need to scale, what do we do? We literally had this kind of conversation. I remember sitting in a conference room, and something had happened where we were sort of fed up with having to um, continuously upgrade Node. Um, the Node itself is not 1.0. It still isn't 1.0. And the streaming APIs seemed like they were getting updated every single week. It, that wasn't the case. But you know that was what we relied heavily on, because everything we were doing was streaming. Um, so that was kind of our breaking point. And we said to ourselves, you know, how much life does this puppy have left? We've taken venture financing. We need to figure out how to make this thing a sustainable business. Um, and that's kind of the method I approached it with is, you know, as a CEO, I didn't have the luxury of just saying, let's blindly accept uh, a language change. Let's just go at this. We had, you know, major companies on board. So this little guy popped out of nowhere. Um, I literally came to the office one day, and Andy, one of our team members, said to me, hey, you know, I built something over the weekend. Um, I just sort of, you know, replicated our core processing structure, and here it is. Um, you know, take a look at it, see what you think, whatever. And we started to think about it, and what we realized was that we increased our text processing speed by 64% just by taking that out of Node and putting it into Go. And so when he showed me that and he sort of proved this idea of, hey, here is this immediate value. There's immediate value behind what I just showed you. I said, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's go ahead and evaluate again. For us, we said development speed is an A. Um, a for small and big. And when we talk about the development speed from a person who does not know Go, the spec is small. It's not growing. And so it's really easy for someone to get up and running immediately. Um, in addition to that, there's modern features, web sockets, UTF-8, concurrency. Um, UTF-8 was really important to us because of the fact that not every person replies back or talks in English. And so we needed to be able to analyze other languages as well. Um, in addition to that, the runtime speed was super important, and we gave it an A. Cost of purchase, again, free. Cost to administer, an A. Momentum, um, no stylistic work. What does this mean? So, you know, in the beginning, right, with our JavaScript fanboys, we had situations where we literally had a couple hour discussion about how we needed to put commas at the beginning of a new line instead of at the end of the previous line. And, you know, at this point, you're kind of looking at each other being like, all right, guys, you know, I'm glad that you're passionate.
but you know, we need to get back to work. Um, and so the no stylistic board was a super interesting aspect for, from my perspective. Um, talent pool, A plus. I mean, the experienced individual that I've met, there are people who have you know, so much so much experience in the field, but then on top of that, they're intrigued by, you know, by this new hotness and the new, I, I would say, uh, some of the new facets of the language itself. Um, language, I, from an active community, I give it a B plus. Um, the value of it is that it's pretty pragmatic and you're just talking about in the hallway. You no, know, you're not getting these like framework wars going on, which is in a, in a loud way, rather. Um, but it's still early, right? You know, we can all admit that this is an early, this is the first, uh, go for con, for instance. Um, language homogeneity, we use, um, our, actually our front end web servers are also um, Go. And from a large code base support, you know, it is early, but it is being used in production by some very big companies. And so we're able to say, okay, you know, if they can do it, we think we can make it happen as well. Coolness, A plus, I think um, it depends on what your take is of the gopher, but um, that's, that's, we, we thought it was pretty cool. And then from an evil empire standpoint, you know, it gets it's not that net, but Google and Microsoft, I don't know. Um, and that's kind of where we said to ourselves, like, this might be the language for us. Um, this might be the, the, the platform that we need to start moving towards. And so we said to ourselves, you know, taking all of this into consideration, we also had to consider the fact that we don't have time for pulling up ourselves and putting, you know, locking all the doors and just going heads down on go. We didn't have that luxury, we really didn't. Um, we didn't have time to update the version every single week. We didn't have time for high ramp up. We, we didn't have time for wait, to wait for things to compile. We didn't have time for that debug issues because of a typo. We didn't have time to deal with throwing and catching errors. And so, how did we switch? Um, how did we take that move um, and move forward? We basically said, you know, I saw this immediate value from Andy, and I told him, hey, put a plan in place, and we can review it, and we can see if it makes sense within our timeline. Um, by demonstrating immediate value, by actually writing something that actually showed an improvement, 64% by 64%, we, I started to believe a little bit that this thing would work. Um, we made a cohesive, pragmatic plan. It was ominously called Project Winter, but um, it was like right around the same time Game of Thrones was happening, so it was definitely um, a little bit ominous. But um, we took an approach of systematically separating out processes. Um, and we really forced ourselves to adhere to a separation of concerns model, and that has proved to be so incredibly important. I, I mean, I can't, even, I can't even stress that enough, that today as we've continued to iterate on our product, and we've continued to rip out certain components of it, it's totally easy for us to do that because of doing, because of how we built things. Now, this is a very arrow-heavy diagram. Andy, who was sitting in the front row, got a little bit excited by arrows. Um, he was like, RPC calls in all over the place. But anyway, um, we started with our app server. So we took a piecemeal approach, and this did not happen overnight. In fact, it happened over the course of an entire year. This diagram was the actual first diagram that we put together. It evolved over time. But we started with our app server, um, our core processing logic, which is what we kicked off with. Um, then we basically ripped out our proxies. So we used, um, we have proxies that, uh, that allow us to connect to our different data streams, Facebook, Twitter, um, and then we have a bunch of other uh, text that's coming in as well. And we ripped those out and separated those into their own area. Um, what's not pictured here, we also pulled out our um, visual server, which generates on-demand on graphs. And then um, just this past fall, we finally got to the point where we brought our web front end into GoLand. So um, that was really, that was kind of the process there in terms of things. We didn't say, let's just go head down and go. And I think that that's the key element here, is that there was a very pragmatic approach to slowly taking out components of the application and converting them into Go, and then slowly adding features as we did that. Um, so that was that was kind of what what we did. In terms of what's been great, um, there's a few different things, but um, we saw immediate benefits obviously from the 64% processing speed. UTF-8 became critically important for us as we started to deal with other languages. Um, with concurrency 
baked in. We, we definitely um, have taken advantage of that. Um, and then after moving over our web front from Node to Go, we had a number of scenarios where we literally were singing praises um, that we were in this, we had, we had made the move before it, got, it became too late. And that's, I think, the thing that, um, you know, we have friends who work at different companies, other startups that scale aggressively, and sometimes things do get a little bit too late if you don't get ahead of these problems. And so um, one particular scenario um, in which we prevailed against uh, Twerker, meeting 4chan, meeting Eric Snowden, all on Thanksgiving, the actual holiday itself. What happened? We got DDoS um, and attacked by the Syrian Electronic Army, 4chan, Anonymous, and a bunch of script kiddies all at once, all on Thanksgiving Day. Why did this happen? Um, well, a few different reasons. So, um, in terms of how we handle it, I'll go into why it happened, but um, the memory footprint is minor, performance is so good that when we did get DDoS with upwards of 6,000 KPS or GPS, the database started struggling before, before our web front end even started struggling. And, and that was a sign to us. We didn't even see a spike in our web front end. That's, and we didn't even get an alert until it was hitting our database to the point where it could not keep up. And so we had to get online get up, and, and make some changes. We had to bring up new Mongo servers. It was a very hectic scenario. We put ourselves behind Cloudflare. Um, it was it was fun, but um, needless to say, um, we thanked we thanked the team for for actually moving forward with Go when we did. Um, here's a snapshot of a request profile during that time. Um, it was pretty freaky, um, and all of this came because we were running the Time Person of the Year survey, um, where people were able to tweet whoever they wanted to win. Um, and again, Eric Snowden was on there, S Syrian leaders were on there, Miley Cyrus was on there. And when you combine all of those incredibly important world leaders together, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't even think Bieber was, was he? I don't know. But um, I feel like it was, a, it, was a, you know, it was basically a recipe for disaster, and we would not have, I think that that could have been a breaking point, honestly, for the entire company, because not only did we have time going, but we had all of our other customers up and running as well. Um, so why not 100% go? Um, there's a couple of different reasons why, but um, one of the main reasons why we didn't go 100% go is because we do have a lot of shared code between the front end and the back end relative to our, um, our image server. And that image server itself is really good at generating graphs on the fly. Um, there was really no reason for us to rewrite that in, in Go. And I think that that's the key element here is that when, when evaluating what, the, evaluating the choices that we were going to make, um, we couldn't just go all gung-ho on Go. The vast majority of our code base is Go, but I think thinking about what is the right tool for the job obviously comes into play. I know you guys are a mature audience. Um, but despite Node's flaws, we still felt like the, there are some things that do need to be in Node. Um, and it still communicates very well with the rest of our application, um, and we're very happy with where things have gone since then. So um, that's my that's my talk. So thanks so much.